My name is Wenchen Ouyang. I'm the convener of BA Arabic at SOAS, and we have prepared some presentation for you to introduce you to the Arabic program at SOAS, which I will take us through bit by bit. Uh, so I will start and then my colleague, Mr. Saeed, will give you a presentation of, on the Arabic alphabet and followed by my colleague, Dr. Nada Zir, who will provide you with the taster of what Arabic sounds like. And then we'll round out our presentation with Professor Hugh Kennedy. Um, so, uh, and then towards the end of my presentation, which I hope will take about five minutes, I will introduce you to all the colleagues in the Arabic section, whom you, if you come to SARAS next year, you'll be sort of like, uh, you will encounter and work with. So let me start my presentation on the Arabic in the world. Arabic is one of the six official languages of the United Nations. It's the lingua franca of the Arab world, and it is the liturgical language of 1.8 million Muslims, and it is the fifth most spoken language of the world with uh, 422 22 million speakers. Um, the Arabic language emerged right between the, four, the first and the fourth centuries uh, through linguistic encounters with other languages. It has influenced and has been influenced, for example, by Persian, Turkish, Hindustani, including Hindu and uh, Hindi and Urdu, Kashmiri, Kurd Kurdish, Bosnian, Kazakh, Bengali, Malay, Indonesia, Malaysian, Maldivian, Pashto, Punjabi, Armenian, Armenian, Azerbaijani, Sicilian, Spanish, Greek, Bulgarian, Tagalog, Sindhi, Odia, and Hausa, just to name a few. And it developed and continues to develop into intercultural exchanges. And this is the context. Uh, through which we teach Arabic at SOAS. So we have two kinds of program in which Arabic are included at the undergraduate level, BA Arabic, whether as a single subject or joint degree. And this is a four year degree, including a year, third year abroad in one of the Arab countries. It is also part of BA languages and cultures, Arabic pathway. And this program can be three years or four years. Right? If you're in the four year degree, you will be eligible to go to year abroad as well. Right? So we teach Arabic in three contexts, right? in the Arabic language, culture, and literature. And from past to present, we do classical Arabic as well. And also we look at the development Arabic around the world. So it's not just the Arab world itself. And we look for the following learning outcomes, knowledge of the region, and language sphere, i.e. the Arab world and the part of the world that speaks Arabic or uses Arabic, where in the global south, in the Middle East, right? And this knowledge will be based on experience of living in the region. This is the function of the year abroad, right? And at the end of the program, you'll pick up language and linguistic skills in addition to disciplinary skills and literacy in Arabic culture and literature. And culture, of course, and literature include history as well, cinema as well, right? Uh, so the Arabic program, and now let me introduce you to the member staff who sort of like teach on the Arabic program. We have Professor Hugh Kennedy, right? Could you wave your hand, Hugh? Right, Professor Hugh Kennedy. And if you're interested in knowing about our research, you're welcome to Google us. Now you have our name spelled out there for you. And then the followed by me, Wenchin Ouyang, I'm Professor of Arabic and Comparative Literature. And Dr. Marley Hammond, you might not be able to see her, right? Uh, she should be with us somewhere. And she works on Arabic popular culture and literature. And we have Dr. Chris Lucas, who works on Arabic linguistics is on leave this year, but he'll be back in fall and you'll be able to see him. And Mr. Mohammed Said, please uh, wave your hand, Mohammed. He's a senior lecturer in Arabic. And Dr. Nada Zir, I don't know whether you can see her, but wave your hand, Nada, right? Uh, uh, she's a lecturer in Arabic and who will be speaking to you in a little while. Uh, Maha Collinson, lecturer in Arabic, and Mr. Ahmed Al Khasham, senior lecturer in Arabic, and Ms. Muna Hamad, senior lecturer in Arabic, and also Mr. Wa'il Ouda, senior lecturer in Arabic. And we have 
three presentations today. We'll start with Mr. Mohammed Said, followed by Dr. Nada Zir, and then followed by Professor Hugh Kennedy. And after our presentations, there'll be an opportunity for, for you to ask us questions, and we hope to be able to answer them to your satisfaction. So thank you very much for coming. And Mohammed Said, right? It's yours. The floor is yours. Thank you. Now, we all ask ourselves when we see the Arabic script written, when we see it, what is the origin of this language, this script, this writing? Uh, now, let's go back to the languages before they were written. Languages started oral, as we all know. And we have received many oral literature, which was written maybe centuries after it started. Uh, the very advanced and elaborate and complicated way of writing we see nowadays uh, did not start like this. It started in a more simple forms. If we go to the ancient world, like, for example, uh, ancient Egypt, we may see what they call hieroglyphic, which is mainly drawings on temples and uh, other archaeological sites. Uh, but uh, experts and uh, Egyptologists uh, can interpret these drawings into proper messages and meanings. Also, after the drawing, there was another form of expressing before the the development of real letters and real writing, experts call it the cuneiforms. Uh, this was used in Mesopotamia, uh, the Sumerians and the Assyrians, mainly the Sumerians developed the uh, cuneiform writing. It's simply, if I want to simplify what's cuneiform, it's a way of using a, a sharp knife or, or, or a, actually in Arabic it's called al mismariya, a mismar, a kind of very sharp uh, pointed uh, instrument in which they used to sort of scroll on clay and uh, maybe uh, put this clay in, in ovens and, and preserve it. Uh, then mankind always developing, uh, suddenly uh, some kind of what we call nowadays letters started to evolve. And here's a very nice story. I heard it a long time ago. On the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, uh, during the 20s of the last century, there was an illiterate peasant plowing his field. And when his plow turned the earth, he saw a small stone with things kind of inscribed on it. He picked it up and put it in his, in his pocket because he was inquisitive and took it with him back home. The whole village had one man who could read and write. These men in these villages used to be everything, used to be <laughs> the teacher, if they teach, and the sheikh, he would lead the prayer. And if anybody needed to write a letter or a form, uh, to fill a form to the government, he writes it for them. So this kind of semi-literate man, uh, the, 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 the peasant took it to his sheikh, the man, and the sheikh looked at it and said, well, I don't know what language is this. I think we should take it to the captain. Now, who is the captain? Down the road from that village, there was, in, in the 20s, the French were occupying the Syrian and the Lebanese coast. And the Syrian and the Lebanese coast is the land of the Phoenicians, as we know. Uh, so he said, let's take it to the captain. The captain should be able to, to explain that. Maybe it's French. They took it to the captain. The captain looked at it, and he was bemused. He didn't understand the thing. He said, we should send it to the general in Beirut. It was sent to the general in Beirut. And when it reached the general in Beirut, it was wrapped and sent in very, very guarded diplomatic uh, post uh, to Paris, and it ended up in the Louvre. I'm talking about the Phoenician alphabet. 
Now, is the Phoenician al alphabet the mother of all the, uh, let's say, Semitic alphabet? Semitic means the languages of the Middle East. I'll talk about them later. Uh, before I give my opinion, I will refer you to go and visit a very nice small room in the British Museum. When you join us in Sawas, next door to Sawas, we have the British Museum, one of the most, you know, you know, attractive things in London. Uh, I, sh I think every student in Sawas, whenever they have an hour in the afternoon, in instead of spending it in the junior common room playing billiard, they should go to the British Museum. Okay, if you go there and search for this room, the writing, the, the history of the writing, you will see the history of all the alphabets. And you may see which alphabet was the, the first. I'm not going to claim. I would like to claim it is the first because I come from that part of the world, but I'll leave that to you to discover. Now, uh, then of course, there were other discoveries which were as, as important, maybe more important than discovering the, the Rosetta Stone, which is also in the Louvre. Uh, now, from that, we started to notice and see uh, many other forms and shapes evolving from these letters. Now, the oldest Arabic script we can see is not really manuscript. It is writing on headstones of, of you know, graves in the desert. There is a stone called the Namara stone. It was discovered in the Syrian desert. Uh, it belongs to the fourth uh, century AD, but it was before the development of the dots and the uh, signs on, on top of letters and before even connecting the letters, it needs an expert to read it. But what I'm going to show you now on the screen is the uh, kind of the full advanced form of the Arabic letters, and let's call them alphabet, and, and later I'll tell you why we call it alphabet. I'm going to read you these letters and I'm not expecting you to go uh, having memorized them, but I want you to feel the sound and I want you to see the shape and uh, the kind of the flow from right to left. The first letter is unique on its own. It doesn't belong to a group of letters. We call it in Arabic, Alif. Each letter has a name and a sound. The sound is usually the first part of the name. So if I call it Alif, it means the sound is up. The second group, three letters, they share the shape, but they differ in the, either the number or the place of the dot. The names are Ba, Ta, Tha. The third group, Jim, Ha, Kha. You are going to hear some sounds you're not familiar with. It's our job when you join us to train you to master these sounds. The fourth line, Dal, Dal. Now, the sound dal is very interesting for you who speak English. You have this sound, but to express it, you need two letters. You put T and H to produce one sound. Arabic doesn't put two letters together to produce one sound. Each letter has a sound and each sound has a letter. Let me carry on. I don't want to, uh, to slow you down. Ra, Zain, Sin, Sheen, interesting. In English, the sound esh depends on the sound s. In Arabic, there are two different letters, but they are sister letters. Are letters feminine or masculine? Brother letters. Seen and sheen. Saab and dab. You can hear the emphatic sound of some of the Arabic letters. Saab and dab. Ta and va. Ain and rain. I think that's uniquely Arabic. You know, you say Arabs, we don't say Arabs, we say Arab. Hear that, that very interesting sound, very strong sound. Arab. Ain, rain, fa, kaf. Now, it's a very interesting group. I want you all to hear it, and, and I am sure had I been giving this talk in a classroom, I would have stopped and asked you a question. Now I'm going to ask the question and answer it myself. Fa, kaf, kaf, lam, mim. Noon. Let me repeat. Kaf, lam, mim, noon. I wonder if among the uh, the people listening to this webinar, if anybody knows any language which doesn't have these four letters in this very order. Uh, as far as I don't know many languages, 
but all the languages I know, they have K, L, M, N in this order. Kaf, Lam, Mim, Nun. The interesting thing, all the groups before they share the shape and differ either in the existence or non-existence of dots and the number of dots. But these Kaf and Lam and Mim and Nun, they don't share a shape as if they are unique on their own. Now, the last line is another very interesting line, and I don't know why the Arabic alphabet delayed them to the end. I will give my opinion why. It's ha, wow, ya. Let me repeat and hear them how soft. Ha, wow, ya. I think you will agree with me, those of you who have English as a mother tongue, that wow and ya are vowels. You may argue with me that the H is not a vowel. I think it is a vowel. Say clapam and see how you swallow it. It's not a strong consonant. But all these letters can be consonants, can be vowels. It depends on their position in the word. Now, why we call it an alphabet? An alphabet in Arabic is called abjadiyya. Let's read these four uh, green letters vertically. Alif, ba, jim, dal. Abjad. Abjad. So an alphabet is abjadiya. While in Greek, alphabet, the gamma, alphabet is an alphabet. Now, this is now the Arabic alphabet. Uh, is it only used by Arabic? As my colleague said in the beginning, uh, Professor Young, when she mentioned the influence of Arabic on other languages, well, uh, many of the neighboring languages are currently using, and some of them used to use, the Arabic alphabet. Persian, Urdu, uh, even Ottoman Turkish used to use the Arabic alphabet, but they stopped, used it, they, stopped, they stopped using it in the 1920s when they converted the Turkish language into the Latin alphabet. But you can still see the, the influence of, of some of these letters, even on the current Turkish words and nouns, even if they are not writing them in this script. This has developed and uh, recently now uh, we don't rely on writing and handwriting. Now, if you look in any uh, old library, in any museum, uh, most of the Arabic uh, we inherited from the Arabs of say from the sixth to the 14th or 15th century were, or 16th century even 17th, were manuscripts handwritten. But what developed the Arabic writing further is the invention uh, of uh, the printing. Uh, now, the, Arab, the Arabic printing is widely uh, spread now. And recently now, we are very lucky we have the digitization. Maybe we only have to talk, and the machine will convert our talk into writing. This is a very quick taster of the Arabic alphabet and the Arabic writing. I hope you will all you will all join us in September, where I will be teaching you how to link these letters and turn them into words and how to uh, organize these words into sentences and how to develop your sentences into paragraphs and how to develop the paragraphs into text and essays. Thank you very much. I, I am happy to answer any question at the end. Thanks. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, uh, Nada, where are you? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Nada Elzir. My colleague, Professor Uyang, has already introduced me. I'm a lecturer um, of Arabic at SOAS. And today uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of the Arabic language, which is uh, idioms or set phrases. These are imageries. Uh, you have them in every language. Uh, in Arabic, we have a lot of them across the dialects, every dialect has its own. There are also some that are common. Um, what is an idiom or a set phrase? It is uh, when you express something with an image rather than with direct words. For example, in English you'd say, I am under the weather instead of saying I am unwell. And I became very interested in idioms, especially colloquial ones because they are more threatened. Uh, than the written ones when I became old enough to be interested in spending time with my grandmother. And by then I was already, I mean, my inclination was always languages since I was um, little and I was schooled bilingually. And when I started spending time with my grandmother in my teenage years, I noticed that she speaks very differently 
to us. She uses more metaphors and more images, but they were not her own. They were already existent in the language, but my generation wasn't using them. And then I started worrying about these um, phrases disappearing and I started collecting idioms that I don't hear much used by my generation. And then I started doing it for other dialects like the Egyptian dialects, the Syrian dialect, which is very close to ours. Uh, I'm from Lebanon, by the way. And I live, uh, I, I grew up very, very close to the Syrian border. I could walk into Syria. So uh, today, I think rather than do something formal, again, it uses something we have in written Arabic and in spoken, they are slightly different. I'm going to uh, take you through uh, small idioms, nothing very creative, but like short set phrases uh, that refer to the human body. And uh, we were going to look together at what they mean. And uh, please, if you'd like to have a guess what everyone, uh, each of these idioms means, you can either put your hand up. I don't know if that's technically possible. If not, you can write in the, in the window, in the, in the chat window, what it means. So I'm now going to share my screen. Um, where is it? There it is. Can you see the list? So. Um, on the left, of, of course, you've got them written in Arabic. I've got the transliteration in the middle column and then what they mean literally, which is doesn't mean anything. Of course, we're going to try to guess what they mean. So if we say about a man, this is the Lebanese pronunciation, very similar to the Syrian one. That means his arm is long. Can you guess what someone whose arm is long is? What, what does that mean? If your arm is long or your hand is long? Anyone? Um, I'm not sure I can see the chat window. Anyway, it means that you are likely to steal. This is someone with an inclination for stealing. But if you say, idu taile, both idu tawile, tawile means like tall, it is like tall, tall tawil, and tile is from the same root. It means it can reach far. If you say, idu tawile, he's a thief. If you say, idu taile, it can reach far. It means he's a powerful man with connections. So he can get things done by using his connections. If your arm is far reaching, we also have a proverb where you say, Asira, the arm is not far reaching, it's short. And that means you don't have money and you can't afford things. My favorite one is next. If we say about a woman, Aina Milieni, Aina Milieni, it means her eye is full. And what that basically means is that this is someone who grew up in a good home. They are not greedy. They don't drool over material possessions. You show them whatever, they're not gonna stoop low to have it. They are a bit lofty and proud and they, they don't drool over stuff. So this is if your eye is full. But if your eye is empty, then you are the opposite. Nothing will fill your eye in Arabic means that you always want more. You are never satisfied, greedy, and you really would humiliate yourself for to have anything. That's where I know fadi. But fadi is a, it's the colloquial pronunciation of empty. There is another pronunciation, which is fadi. If you look at these two words here, the only difference between them is that the top one has a stick. That's the A, ah, the Alif, that my colleague, Mr. Sa'i, just introduced. This is just one pronunciation of it. And once you take the second pronunciation and say, her eye is empty, the meaning is that her eye is full. So again, this is someone who wouldn't stoop low. So your eye is full, <laughs> and this, your eye is empty, mean the same thing. But this, your eye is empty, means the opposite. How this came to be the case, I don't know. But it's very interesting and it brings me to the next one where we say about someone, Samao, his hearing, Khafif, his hearing is light. If someone's hearing is light, that they don't have a lot of hearing, it's very light, it means they can't hear well. So what is Samao il? His hearing is heavy. It should mean that he can hear well, but it also means he can't hear well. So whether your hearing is light or heavy, you can't hear well. 
And then this is my absolute favorite and a staple of my childhood. It's one of my mother's favorite things to say to us. It says, labis wujju bil ma'lub. It means, so this is now incorporating the face, to be wearing your face upside down. This is when you're grumpy and not smiling at anything. You're wearing your face the wrong way, means you are grumpy. We have a lot, a lot of expressions to do with blood. I've only got three of them here. So we say about someone, damma berid, her blood is cold. We could also say, damma khafif, her blood is light. Or we could say, damma il her blood is heavy. We could also say that she doesn't have any blood baladam, at all. So what do they mean? If your blood is cold, it means you are unimpressionable. There is nothing that will spur you into action. Basically, you're not easily impressed, but it's in a way that frustrates people. Nothing will, like you will watch any atrocity or something bad happening, you don't care. People will insult you, you don't care. It is hard to move you. If, as opposed to cold, your blood is light, that means you are a funny person with a sense of humor. Nice, funny, not funny, haha. Um, but if, so this is if your blood is cold, if your blood is light, if it's heavy, it means you are a lot to take. It is these people when they're talking and you can't wait till they get to the end of the sentence. They're just too much to bear. Their blood is heavy. Uh, we will do the bloodless one some other time. It's enough now, negativity. Uh, let's go to uh, finish on a nice note. For example, if you say someone, albu, note here that I say, albu, albu that's the colloquial pronunciation. This letter, however, in Arabic is q, and it's one of the hardest letters to pronounce, q, uh, which is why the various dialects, except in North Africa, have found ways to pronounce it that don't require them to say q in the Levant, in Lebanon, Part, most of Lebanon and most of Syria, we say uh, as they do in Egypt and the Gulf, they say g. In Morocco, they still say q. So if someone's heart is thin, al that is that means this is a kind person who is easily moved by what they see. They are emotional and nice, and you can get a reaction. Um, out of them, as opposed to bala alb without a heart, which is the same in English, it is heartless person. Um, yeah, that's all from me. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm now going to give way to my colleague, Professor Kennedy, who will take you on a tour around historiography. So enjoy that. So I just want to say that we've got about 10 to 15 minutes left, and we've got to have the little Q&A session yeah, as we'll well, just to let everyone know. Yeah. Well. Okay, well, hello to everybody, and it's very nice that you've all come. And what we're trying to do is introduce us, of you of course, to various aspects of Arabic studies. And one of the things you get by having a university degree in Arabic studies, as opposed to simply going to a language school, is you get a range of different sorts of Arabic, and you see Arabic through the centuries, the whole richness of the way in which it's developed in different places, which is something that, that Nada has just been talking about, but the whole way in which it develops through time and so on. And I am essentially a historian. I write history books and I write history books using classical Arabic sources, i.e. the chronicles that were written sometimes a thousand years ago, but which we still use as the foundations of our study. Now, classical Arabic, is a bit like Shakespeare's English is to modern English, i.e. a lot of the grammatical forms are the same, a lot of the words are, are the same, there's a long continuity over a thousand years between uh, words for gum and go and things like that. On the other hand, if you really want to understand what's going on, just as if you're reading Shakespeare, if you really want to understand what's going on in his plays, you have to do a bit of research, you have to acquire a different sort of vocabulary, and a different way of expressing the grammar and so on. And that's what I uh, like to teach people and to encourage people to experiment with. And as um, the great advantage of this or the benefits of this is that you get access to a fantastic 
historical literature. Great chronicles recording deeds, good and bad, of people through the centuries, uh, from the time of Prophet Muhammad, uh, really in the 630s, right through to the uh, 20th century. But you also get an insight into the way these people thought, what their concerns were, what their anxieties were, what they thought was good conduct and what they thought was bad conduct. They make judgments. And so by reading the historical material, you just don't, you don't just get all sorts of names and dates of rulers, and sometimes the numerous names and dates of rulers can seem a bit overwhelming, but you get an insight into what people thought, what they were anxious about, how they interpret their world, how they tried to make things better for themselves and the communities they were living in. And so by looking at the classical Arabic, you get a much richer understanding of the language, but you also uh, get a much richer understanding of, of, of the people who spoke it and used it through the centuries. Now, one of the fantastic things about coming doing the study at Zoas is that it has the most wonderful library. And it is the most wonderful library, partly because it's got a huge variety of Arabic texts, Arabic books available to you. But also, as a first year undergraduate, you can go in there, a first year student, you can go in there, you can look along the shelves, you can take books off the shelves and see what they're like. In many libraries, in universities and other libraries, you have to book in advance, you have to know what you're going to do and blah, blah, blah. Zoas, it's all open for you. You can just spend an afternoon at random almost, finding out what there is to read and so on. So, as I say, I think that uh, the teaching that we, we do in the department, amongst other things, and we've talked a lot about uh, the language and the, the, and the so on, a, a lot of the things is to encourage you to explore the whole richness and variety, not just of Arabic language itself, but Arabic thought and the thought of Muslims and non-Muslims who've used Arabic through the centuries and the way they've seen their world and interpreted their world. And I think it's totally fascinating. And I hope Lots of you can get fascinated by it as well. And we look forward to seeing you, uh, inshallah, as the Muslims say, in uh, October. Thank you. Now we pass over to the Q&A. Brilliant, that was great. Um, so we're just gonna move on to the Q&A portion. Like I said, you can put your questions in the chat function if you want to, or alternatively, we have the Q&A section where you can put in your question and our academics or our student ambassadors can answer the questions that you might have. We've just had a question come in. Um, hopefully one of our academics can answer it. Is, um, so two of the very same questions, which countries are allowed on the list for the year abroad? And again, similarly, where um, are students going for their year abroad? Uh, right now we have two destinations, a Najah University in Nablus in Palestine and Qasid in Jordan, in Amman, Jordan. But we hope to be able to sort of increase those to five, maybe one in North Africa and one in Egypt, as soon as COVID-19 is over and we can travel. Um, right now, um, students are doing their Arabic year abroad online, but hopefully as soon as everybody's vaccinated and travel is permitted, they'll be able to travel to Jordan and Palestine. Lovely. Um, we've had a question that's asking, would it be ideal to have an A-level in Arabic to do the program? That's I Mohammed's can, I, I can come to that. Uh, now, obviously, not everybody joining us in September is an absolute beginner. What we have, we call it the placement test. We'll give you a placement test. We'll take into consideration if you have a GCSE or an A-level in the language. And according to the placement test, we choose the right level for you and the right modules for you. Uh, my kind of guess as early as now, if you have an A level in Arabic, you are likely to be in our level. 
we have six levels, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you, if you already have an A-level in Arabic, a good A-level in Arabic, i.e. B or A or A+, plus, A star, you are likely to be either in level three or level four directly. That doesn't mean we don't have enough levels for you throughout your course. Say you do in your first year level three, then in your uh, second year level four, then you go do the year abroad, you come back either to level six, or even if level six is below your level, we can give you translation projects, we can give you language use modules. Yes, we have had many people who are coming with A-levels, but let me tell you something, people who are doing A-level. Currently, GCSEs and A-levels don't have enough grammar. They are based mainly on uh, language comprehension. So if you want us to sort of to be impressed with your A-levels, I recommend you brush up your grammar before you come to the placement test. It might make a difference between going to level three or level four, but it does not mean you shorten your degree from four years to three years. You still need to do four years. I hope I answered it. Brilliant. Um, I think one very similar to this, I'm just going to answer before Nada goes on to the next question is, um, do we need to have an A-level in any foreign language or is it okay if you don't have one? Okay, I can put my other hat now. I am the admission tutor. I, I have, if you applied, I have read your application form. If you haven't, I'm going to read it. Uh, we look at other things as well. We look to what we call language learning background, language learning experience. It doesn't have to be a full A-level. You can tell me I grew up in a bilingual house. You can tell me I traveled in the Arab world. You can tell me I learned French by myself. A, GCS, a good GCSE in a foreign language is good. But we are not going to penalize the students for this, sorry to use this word, we are not going to penalize the students for the stupidity of the government which has stopped making foreign languages compulsory in, in most secondary school in this country. So if we say we insist on an A-level in a language, which means we don't take anybody because uh, most of the state schools now don't teach, well, they teach foreign languages, but up to year 10, uh, or even year nine, <laughs> and they don't teach it further, i.e. a GCSE in a foreign language is not compulsory. So we, we, we want to give opportunity to people to learn languages, but they have to show us language interest, language background, language aptitude, uh, etc. So no, you don't have to have an A-level in Arabic or an A-level in French. We like it if you have it. It might make a difference between offering you AAB or ABB, uh, but no, you don't need it. We look in your personal statement for other signs of language ability or language interest. Thank you. So Amani, there are questions in the chat box. How was the year abroad structured in terms of lessons and social life? Um, they're structured around both. So every week when you go on year abroad, you have about 15, 16 hours of lessons and then the rest is immersion. So you're encouraged to let's say live with the family and do things and, and Nablus and Najah University actually uh, organize uh, social events for you and take you out on tours and so on and so forth. Um, and you have further questions, please write them in. Uh, there are two, we, we teach two dialects at the uh, right now, uh, Levantine and Egyptian. Uh, and maybe one day we used to teach Gulf as well, but maybe one day we can bring this back as well. Okay. Uh, if, if, uh, I may come, uh, if I may come, if there are no questions to, okay. the, to, the, to the student. No, the Muhammad, the questions. Wait, uh, wait a second, there, there are questions in the sort of Q&A. Uh, if you do Arabic as a double program, right, does this effectively double your workload? Not, not at all. You'll have exactly the same workload as you would do a, a single degree. Let's say, you know, every year you have to do 120 credits. So if you do a single degree, you'll do most of them in, in Arabic and in the department languages and cultures. But if you do a double degree, you'll do 60 credits in our department in Arabic and 60 in another subject. Um, and classical Arabic is in, uh, incorporated into our syllabus, uh, 
so we have classical Arabic at uh, uh, not in the first year, but in the second year, there'll be classical Arabic modules for you to choose from. And in the fourth year, there'll be classical Arabic modules for you to choose from. For example, Professor Hugh Kennedy teaches a module called Reading Classical Arabic Historians. So that will be classical. And I teach uh, um, uh, Dr. Hammond and I, uh, alternate in teaching culture, society, and, and, uh, and politics in classical Arabic literature. And in the second year module, part of it, there was a part that's classical Arabic literature as well, or classical Arabic writing. Uh, so on the year abroad, do students stay with both? Uh, st uh, but students can stay with families if they find host families or student accommodation if that's what they prefer. Uh, to work during the, I, uh, would you advise, uh, Muhammad, would you advise, uh, would you be ad advise students to work during the year abroad for living cost? Yes, yeah, it, let's, let's talk about this. Okay. As you all know, when you are uh, not a citizen from a certain country and you want to work, you may need work permits, but that doesn't mean you can't find part-time jobs or you can't volunteer with NGOs or you can't teach English as a foreign language to kids. Many, many of our students, when they go abroad, and I'll introduce Grace in a second, uh, they do find jobs, but I don't think you will find jobs with income full enough to sustain your cost. But remember, cost of living in the Arab world is cheaper than London. But I wanted to say before we finish the time, because no questions have been addressed to the student rep, I want to introduce one of our brilliant students, Grace Elliott. And can you, Grace, say something, even if they're not asking you anything? <laughs> yeah, hi. So I'm now a third year Arabic student. So I'm studying at Qasid Institute in Jordan, but I'm studying virtually. So I have quite a different um, experience than hopefully you guys will have, I guess. Um, I see a lot of people asking about like the level of language proficiency. So right now I've been studying Arabic for two and a half years. I can read everything, even if I don't understand the word of it, I can read fluently, I can write, I can hold conversations with people now. Um, the first year was really just focusing on learning the alphabet and um, reading and getting some basic vocab. And then in the second year, you start to build up a bit of confidence with listening and with speaking. But really now, um, uh, in your year abroad, I think is when your speaking uh, proficiency probably increases the most. Um, in terms of um, dealing with two uh two degree courses i did start off doing arabic and french but to be honest with you i enjoyed arabic a lot that i changed to um just arabic but of course i could manage and balance quite easily arabic and another language or i'm sure you can do that with arabic um and like business and law and things like this um i think that really the teaching at soas is is really amazing to be honest and i'm really enjoying it and really enjoying my year abroad as well. It's nice to have a break in the middle, just to mix up the start of teaching and stuff, definitely. Um, I'm just a bit conscious of time because I think we should be wrapping up in the next couple of minutes. Um, just a question for the academics. Is there any way for the students to reach you if any of their questions haven't yet been answered from the Q&A session? Just because I don't think we'll be able to get through everything. Yes, uh, Amani, if you share the PowerPoint, I prepared, mm -hmm. right, there's a list of our names, our titles, and our email addresses as well. Okay, fabulous. So that'll be circulated after the taste today. May I add to that, uh, please, uh, candidates and uh, potential students, when you write to me as the admission tutor, can you start your email by saying, I've been to the inside day and I still have a question. When I see the sentence at the beginning of the email, I give it a priority. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Well, I just want to say thank you to all the academics that have joined. Thank you to Grace as well. And thank you to everyone that's attended. I hope that this has been a useful session for you. Um, again, we'll be circulating the recording and hopefully the presentation as well after the session, if you do have any more questions. So yeah, thank you all very much.